on this episode of Eager to Know, figuring out the next step in all of the things we deal with when just starting out. We all have a creative part of our brain, whether we use it or not, for generating new ideas, problem solving, and just viewing ourselves in this world. I am Ricky McEachran, an artist living in Chicago, and I am eager to know and share with you all how people of a creative leaning have brought this way of thinking to the forefront and how it has shifted outcomes. Many of the guests I have had on Eager to Know are people who are well-established in their creative careers. Oftentimes, we talk about what it was like when they just started out, the challenges they had, and how they got things moving. I decided I wanted to speak with some people who are currently in the early stages of a creative journey. I wanted to speak to them about what they are currently experiencing today. My guests today are an actor and a painter who are just starting out. So Hannah and Kevin, thank you for joining me today. I wanted to get a couple of folks that are early in their creative journey um, to talk about being early in your creative journey. And I wanted to specifically get people that do different things. And Hannah, you're obviously an actor. Mm -hmm. And um, Kevin, you are a visual artist. So can you just, Hannah, let's just start with you. Can you just briefly tell me about being an actor and what you're currently doing? Yeah, absolutely. So I moved here about a year ago from Seattle, um, worked for about four or five years in Seattle and just felt like it was time for something new and different. Chicago is a bigger market. There's more opportunity. It's a lot less expensive than New York. Um, and so the process of getting restarted in a city where you're not in school and you don't have a lot of connections is uh, kind of looks like taking classes, sending your headshot and resume out to people, trying to get someone to call you back. Um, it's tough. It's a lot of my big metaphor that I keep coming back to is that it sort of feels like you're tapping on the glass from the outside looking in, just hoping that someone will come up and go, oh, I hear something. <laughs> yep. Um, and that, you know, getting one foot in the door, taking a class, meeting the right people, getting one audition, getting just one person to call you back. Every, every little thing feels like a step in the right direction. So it's a lot of what feels like cold calling for yep. the first year or two. Okay. That makes sense. Now, yeah. Kevin, tell me a little bit about what where you are in terms of you're doing painting right i paint so yeah um i would say i'm still pretty early in that whole uh process uh, it sounds like she's a little bit further along but i started painting uh let's see fall of 2017 i think okay so yeah i'm just starting to get in some shows i in may i rented out a gallery for a week uh in rogers park and put on like a little show for myself. And that was a really good learning experience. Just, uh, you know, what it takes to, uh, you know, do that, to host all that. And then, you know, meeting a lot of people, getting yep. feedback on my art from strangers. Because a lot of the time, you know, you have your family, your friends that are seeing it. And they can give you honest, some honest feedback, but mostly they'll be <laughs> complimentary. But it yep. was a lot of strangers that I was getting feedback from. And so that was a really good experience and kind of propelled me a little bit forward. And, yeah, that make, that makes sense to me. I know I recently had um, a show where I did have no one that I knew came, and it was a great experience because I knew that all the feedback was from strangers, which right. is very impor important. So it sounds like there's a lot of commonality between where you guys are. You're both kind of figuring out what is the next step? What should I be doing? What do I do today? What do I do this week? What do I do this month? Where where do you get your guidance as to what you should be doing, um, wh where you should be spending your time to move things forward? Are you do you have like other actors that you connect with? Um, yeah, I mean the formula for actors is kind of set in a weird way because really you just need to get a foot in the door with either getting cast in a show or getting an agent. Okay, and so that process, especially in a big city like L.A., Chicago, New York. It's pretty formulaic because you know what you have to do and you just have to be able to, um, like, for example, the first class that I took here was recommended to me by a woman I knew from Seattle who came to DePaul to get her MFA in directing and she recommended a class for me. So I took that class and from that class, I had the um, guy who taught the class recommend that, no, when you're in Chicago, you have to have an agent. Okay, so how do I do that? 
literally Googling people. Okay, how do I submit my information? Okay, these I submitted to this many people. Nobody call me back. Okay, I'm going to try again in six months. Like the formula is pretty set. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting because yeah. I know as a visual artist, it's it's it really isn't. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like for a, for an actor, mm -hmm. there is a there is a set of tasks like a project plan. Yeah. It's just really discouraging and really frustrating. Exactly. However, <laughs> I don't know necessarily with you know visual artists if do you feel that there's a plan that you know what you should be doing well that's a good question so like i didn't go to art school or anything like that so maybe there's more of a plan than i realized yeah. and i just right now i'm just trying to meet people um i'm also taking a class my first painting class um in in, in september so you know maybe hopefully meet some people there just sort of build that connection of artists um that network of artists and yeah, kind of go from there. Yeah. Now, do you, Hannah, do you have a connection of people? I know you're new. But do you have a connection of other actors or people in the industry? I knew one person when I moved here, okay. and that was the woman that I knew from Seattle who came to DePaul. Um, but she was, I mean, again, it takes one person. And yeah. she was the first person that I knew. She was the first person I called when I got here. And she was, she recommended a class to me. And that class has really been a great way for me to meet other actors ask them questions about okay who's your agent how did you get cast with that where do you see your shows all that kind of stuff yeah so one thing you know doing this podcast this is like you guys are episode 28 so i talk to a lot of creative people who are in different phases of their creative journey mm -hmm. um, and one of the common things there's a lot of common things that i hear but one of them is staying connected to others that are doing the same thing as you um, is always something that people that have that are moving things forward for themselves is that's that's always um, an element of their journey of what they do. Um, so in whatever that means, it sounds like you know that's something that you're focusing on. Um, but I you know I would I would agree with that. I mean that was one of the reasons why I started this podcast was because I had you know I moved here a year and a half ago. And didn't really know anyone. I knew one person who was an artist, and I had to think of a way to. Well, there was other reasons, but that was I had to think of a way to meet other artists. And I'm like, all right, well, I'll do a podcast, and then I can invite artists on. Um, you know, it ended up the journey of the podcast has turned into something completely different from that because I actually don't really even have visual artists on that much anymore. But that was the intention: was spending my um, my energy. Um, on something that was going to get that type of result of, of meeting people. So um, so is that, Kevin, is this something, that, how are you going about meeting new people? Or are you? Not, am I putting you on the spot? <laughs> how are you doing it? <laughs> uh, admittedly, I probably could do a little better. Um, you know, obviously there's the internet, which makes it easy to like reach out to certain artists. Um, you know, I follow a lot of artists on Instagram and occasionally I'll be like, I've even just asked them like, oh, how, what colors did you mix to make that? Nice. And so that's been kind of nice to just artists that I admire their work and they'll respond most of the time. So that's right. been cool. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is how we met, but I've gone to um, an art critique. I went three times at a gallery and that's been really good for meeting people yeah. um, and just... Yeah, again, getting feedback from strangers, but also meeting people and, you know, exchanging information and trying to build that network. Yeah, I feel like the internet is such, it causes so many problems, particularly around social media. Um, but I feel very grateful that we have it because it's such a great way to connect with people and particularly, you know, other artists or other actors. It's really, I don't know what people did. Like 25 years ago, if you were a visual artist or even an actor, I guess in you know, I guess you would obviously connect with people, but it just I don't even know exactly how it would be done. I guess it's like physically. And it's funny sometimes you know I'll have a conversation with somebody, and then you just totally forget their name, and you're like, well, I know they painted a sunset in Chicago, and then you can kind of Google that, and you might end up finding them that way. <laughs> And so that's been, that's happened a couple of times. Like, yeah, that's what I, I like the internet for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's, 
and with any city that you go to, there's always going to be um, a women in theater Facebook group. So that's always a really good way to immediately hook into an industry that, hey, you know, the entertainment industry has its faults, absolutely. And it's nice to immediately connect with other women. And it's a safe place to go to say, hey, I had this weird experience or, hey, you know, I got turned down for this role, but I'm really hoping that someone else got it. Um, you know, and just to post about pretty much anything and everything that women in theater deal with. Okay. Um, and it's a good, it's just a good place to gather, place to get information, place to exchange information if you need to. Almost, yeah, I think every single city would have a women in theater Facebook group. Okay, yeah. Th- one of the great things about um, Chicago is because it's such a big city is that there are, there are tons of people that do whatever you do. Mm-hmm. You know, it is because it doesn't really feel like a giant city, really. But when you look at the numbers or when you put something out there or you have like an an interest in something, even at the most obscure thing, there's just so many millions of people that live here. You realize how quickly, you know, how realize quickly how how big it is. Um, So how do you guys keep things moving for yourselves and, and keep yourselves motivated to move things forward? I try to do one thing every day. Okay. So whatever that looks like, whether it's you go to see a show, okay. you get coffee with someone who you saw on a show that you want to talk to because you like their work, you send out your headshot and resume to another agency, you whatever you can think of, do and, one thing. And you're pursuing day. acting full time. Correct. Okay. And then Kevin, you are not doing art full time. Is that accurate? Right. That it's been a challenge. Like I work full time right now and um it's definitely less like there's less time for painting than I'd like. Sure. But, um, yeah. I mean, basically I just try the free time that I have. I, I don't really know what else to do. So I kind of just paint and, um, I guess that's how I've been moving forward. I think that sounds like a good plan. Right. So I know, I know for me, I'm much more regimented about in planning my painting time. Um, even though that's what I do full time. Um, but it's definitely more scheduled and, um, I'm not a, um, I don't have anything to do. I think I will whip up a painting type of person. I think maybe if I were, so I was at a job for eight years, um, that got laid off basically like a year ago. And so for a while I was unemployed and then I was partly or, uh, worked part time. And so I think when I, I was a little bit more regimented at, at that point, um, in terms of painting and just scheduling that sort of thing. But now, yeah, I just, I try to use the limited amount of free time I have and just, again, I don't really know what else to do. So I'm like, well, let's yeah. do that. How did you get into painting? Gosh. Um, so it's kind of a weird, st- but like I play this um, Star Wars tabletop game with these like little miniature spaceships. Okay. <laughs> like a Dungeons and Dragons type thing? Sort of. Okay. Um, it's sort of like chess. Okay. But so there's spaceships and I was like, I kind of want to paint these. Okay. So I started painting them and then I was like, oh, this is fun to paint and like make it my own. And then I was also um, sort of seeing someone at this point and I just had a lot of just like, I don't know, pent up emotion and feelings that I didn't know what to do with. So I was like, I'm going to try to paint a painting on a canvas and I did it and it was bad. <laughs> <laughs> How did that work with the feelings, though? Did it? I mean, it was felt it... good. Yeah. And that was kind of, I was like, okay, this is bad, but it made me feel better. And it sort of helped me figure stuff out. And I just painted another one and kind of went from there. Interesting. Yeah. So is that something that is helpful to you in dealing in processing feelings and emotions? I think so. I mean, I think painting for me is like, fairly meditative where it's like you know you're thinking but at the same time it's almost like you're like reptilian part of your brain that's thinking rather than you're like actively thinking yeah so yeah that sort of helps that's part of the reason i really love pain is just like it's almost it's you know you're getting your emotions out onto the canvas but it's also just a calming effect So interesting. The person, I I know when you guys were coming in here, uh, there was someone else that was leaving who was holding a guitar. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was a big part of our conversation is that he uses 
music as a way to do exactly what you just said, to process feelings and as a way to channel them and, you know, heal or just to feel better. Now, I can't imagine acting <laughs> is anything like that. If anything, I is need a escape? break. <laughs> is it escape? I mean, I think... like, do you escape into someone else? Or I don't know. It, it sounds to me it would be more using your brain. But, but I, I don't think know. It is. I, well, every actor is different, to be fair. Um, but I would say, if anything, uh, you know, the last production that I was a part of was The Diary of Anne Frank. And the way that we staged the ending scene was that, you know, in previous iterations of the play, the light, you know, you'd hear the Nazis knocking on the door and the lights would go down and the play would end. In our version, you literally see them come into the home, separate the families, pull them apart, ransack the house and take them. And it was horrific every single night. And we did that play for four months. Oh my and it God. was just, it, I was exhausted by the end because I would cry every single show. And I'm not I'm maybe this is not a plus for my career, but I've never really been one of those actors that can cry on cue. I know people who can do it, and I think it's incredible. Given the circumstances of that particular story, it came so easily every single night. And it was just, we'd all get off stage and into the lobby and just sort of oh, and take a deep breath and like make a joke and pick ourselves back up because we had to do the show again, you know, two hours later. But it was, if anything, I needed. I'd go home and watch like garbage TV at night because I needed a break from the emotions that all of that was living in my body so much that I was like, I need some Great British Bake Off. I need some Dairy Girls. I need something that is just goofy and light and happy that's going to make me forget that I have to go back to the Holocaust tomorrow, you know. So yeah. it depends. I think it depends on the play and depends on the actor. So why did you get into acting? Um... I have little to no athletic ability. Okay. <laughs> and when I was a kid, my pa I had a lot of energy and my parents kept trying to stick me in sports and I was just awful at all of them. Um, and they stuck me in a play when I was, I think, in fifth or sixth grade. And I just, I, I loved it because it was, you know, everyone was looking at me. I was the center of attention. It was so exciting. I could dance, you know, all these things that, you know, I was a super ham as a kid. So it was a good outlet for me. Cool. Now, is that tension a big part of it um, for you still? The tension? The, the, the attention. Oh, the, the attention. Att no, it, if anything, I'm a little embarrassed. <laughs> okay. So it changed from that. It absolutely it changed. It changed into yeah, something I, else. So what is it now? It moved from that to what? I think it moved to more of a, of a desire to tell stories and be a part of something that's bigger than yourself. Um, the For me, the real high of acting is is the communication between the audience and the actors and okay. that it's live. You know, it's not on TV. It's not on film. You can't go back and redo it. If you mess up in the moment, you got to roll with it. So you like doing live stuff? I love live theater. You love live yeah. theater. It's okay. just so exciting. Anything can happen. Yeah. I heard that there's like a relationship that develops between like the performer and the audience. Yeah. Like there's like some sort of connection that happens. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think so. Yeah, I mean, they're, we call them your third scene partner kind of a term that we use so you obviously you rehearse the play you work with the people that you're going to be performing with and you rehearse and rehearse but then you put it in front of an audience and all of a sudden a scene takes on a new life or a joke that wasn't there before becomes a joke because of the way that the audience responds to it so they sort of become the third I don't know piece of information that you receive that influences the show it's very interesting I have um you know I interviewed a bunch of artists called um a group called they won't win and one of the things that I talked to them about was something similar because they spent a lot of time and energy creating all these songs in the studio. Mm. And I asked them, when you finally put it out to the world and people receive it, does it change for them? And they said, yes, it does, because it takes on a whole new meaning when people are receiving it and you see people's reaction. Like you intended it to be one thing and then you see people experiencing it and it means something else. And it sounds like something similar could happen where you're practicing for your performance and then once you do it it could actually change oh yeah and it should that's i mean that's the joy and the excitement of having a live audience is that you're going to get information you didn't have before and it 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 did change for me at least it changes you might do the same show consistently but every show will be slightly different night to night based on how the audience reacts and yeah. it's hard if they're not reacting and then you had this raucous amazing audience the night before as an actor you're up there thinking like oh well do they hate it? I don't know. And you have to knock it in your head and just keep doing your thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm, what, I'm curious. So, like, stand-up comedians, a big thing they have to get over is, like, bombing. Like, is that something that happens, like, you? there's just a night, like, it, you maybe not you in particular, but, like, let's say just all of the actors. It's just not a good <laughs> night. The audience yeah. isn't laughing or maybe... Well, the worst is when you have, maybe you're having a good couple of runs of the show and you've come to a point where you know you get a laugh on a certain line every single night. And so then you start building in space for the laugh because you know it's coming. And the worst is when you build in the, the space for the laugh and it comes... And nobody laughs. And then the actor's like, okay, hurry up, hurry up. Like, keep going because you have to, pacing is everything. So if you lose, if the audience doesn't laugh, someone, whoever talks next, next basically has to be on their toes enough to just jump right in and keep going so that the audience doesn't know, oh crap, what? something was supposed I, to happen I feel there. like that would be <laughs> really hard to get back on track. Like if you were, if you there just was a have gap, to keep yeah, going. I mean, that's why you're a professional. <laughs> yeah. That's why they pay you is just keep going. Don't worry about it. Someone will laugh tomorrow. You know, that's the other thing is that next night could be totally different. Yeah. Stand up terrifies me. I don't think I could ever do stand up because of the exact you're up there by yourself. And if you're not funny, they're going to let you know. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like. But yeah. but like on the flip side, if it works like that must be exhilarating. Yeah, I you would know, imagine. You know what I mean? Like yeah. if people are like falling over laughing or whatever they're responding in the way that you intended mm -hmm. that must be really me, me really exhilarating mm -hmm. um you know i know you talked about how the the creative um the creative output of what you're doing on stage can change you know depending on the audience um i feel the same way with artwork you know i'm working on paintings and then when people see them um and you get the response it really changes so, Kevin, um, is that something that you have experienced? Because you will experience this um, if you haven't already. Which part exactly? Like Meaning that, you know, you think one way. Um, and even even when we were together in these um, situations where, uh, what, what is it called that we where we met? It's called a... Uh, Gallery Studio O. Yeah, but what is it? What was oh, the thing we went just to? Just like an art critique. It was an art critique. Yeah. So how we met was we went to an art critique where we show up and we bring, I think it's a piece of finished work, a piece of unfinished work, oh, and everyone just gives you feedback. And it's kind yeah. of awesome. Yeah. It's really amazing. Um, but I would say that people are giving you feedback and it's very surprising what people say. That's true. There are definitely, um, sometimes there are comments where I'm like, I I would not have got, like, I would never have thought that. And uh, yeah, it's I find it very helpful. Um, I try not to, I don't know if this, sound, I hope this doesn't sound arrogant, but I try not to take too much of what people say to heart because sure. I don't want it to be like all of a sudden now I'm painting what that person wants me to paint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Because then it's like, well, that's now their painting. Yeah. So yeah. I love the feedback I get and I, I've definitely, I try to take kernels of the advice or um, just the general vibe of their advice yes. moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree. I think, I think it's really helpful to just listen and really be open and not be, def you know, certainly don't be defensive about it. Right, I'm right. lucky. No one has ever, everyone has been fairly um, positive about my stuff, which has been, you know, very helpful, but you know, people aren't, aren't always, but yeah, I mean, I think it's important. I, I just think it's interesting that, the questions and comments that people have. And sometimes I'm like, I never had even considered that. Right. Or yeah, like it's, it's very important. To what get. is it like to have, um, you know, cause as an actor, your work is your body. You use your own body as your own, I guess, canvas maybe is a fair comparison. What is it like to be able to stand like for a painting, for example, what is it like to be able to stand there and stare at the same thing that the person next to you is staring at? Like, I'm very intrigued by the fact that your work, is physically separate from you. It's not your own body that's being used as the piece of art. It's something you can look at in front of you. I mean, what is it like to stand there next to someone and be looking at the same thing? Like, do you feel less of a sense of, like, is it easier to have someone critique something that's not physically you, that's something you can stand away from? No. <laughs> <laughs> Me, meaning, I, I don't understand the question. Is it easier for someone to critique something that I didn't create? No, no, something that you did create, but that you can both, it's like a physical object that's separate from you. Okay. Is it, like, I'm, I'm I curious. I think, what, so, like, when somebody critiques 
your acting that's like they're critiquing you. It feels very personal. Right. Yeah. Does it feel any less personal because it's uh, on a canvas? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, I think it feels pretty personal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't say that if someone's saying something, it's it's less personal. But if someone is, it's more about how people behave. Like if people just walk by a painting and mm. they don't stop, yeah. that's that is much more upsetting mm-hmm. than if someone actually critiqued it. Interesting. Like you know, okay. if they didn't, it didn't even register on their radar. Okay. Um, yeah. Like I'm doing Edgewater Art Festival or whatever it's called. Uh, you know, the art festival that's in Edgewater. So I'm gonna have all of my stuff out on the street in September, and like I'm bracing myself because it's just gonna be volumes of people walking by you know i'm sure they're going to be ignoring me Mm -hmm. so i'm going to have to you know brace myself Mm. for for what that's going to feel like but i think that um so what you're i mean do you have any opinion on what she just what she just said no i i i agree um that i guess for me i paint a lot of stuff that's very personal like So I do sort of feel like they're criticizing me, but at this, I do sort of agree. Like at the same time, no, like I, again, I don't get defensive. It's not like I realize it's not a personal attack. And it's also weird. Cause you know, when you look at your own painting, you know how it got there and like what, um, I guess what steps led you there and why you made certain decisions and they don't. And so you're not even looking at the same object. Yeah. It's weird. Like, yeah, you're looking at the same painting, but it's completely different. You know, the story behind it. Yeah. And you just, I don't know, like somebody will be like, Oh, well that red is too bright. And I was like, and you know, and you'll be like, Oh really? Like I didn't even notice that red like that red is it's, nothing to it, me it's not yeah that yeah that, that doesn't mm-hmm. even factor in for me <laughs> yeah type of thing yeah. and so that's Interesting. yeah so yeah that's those comments always surprise me and so i interviewed i don't know if you listened to this episode but i interviewed an actor tony rossi mm-hmm. um did you listen to that not episode? the full episode oh, okay. but a little bit so, yeah. so one of the things that we talked about was actors sometimes being sensitive people and which seemed to be a common trait, according to him. And it, this relates to what you were saying about people are judging like you and your body and your mm-hmm. performance. And I was telling him, like, that sounds like a recipe for disaster. Like you're getting yourself into a situation where you are sensitive and it's, you know, it's important for you to, um, I don't know if impress people, but whatever, you know, you it's important what people think of you. Mm-hmm. And then people are judging you on you. Mm-hmm. Like it's more than than a painting, like you said. Like it is literally you there on the stage, you speaking, you performing. And that just sounds, what I, you know, like I said to him, it was a recipe for disaster. What do you think about that? <laughs> I think that it's, it's a lesson in mental toughness and mm. there's nothing wrong with saying this isn't for me. Mm. So I think that it's tough because it's, a lot of times your sensitivity is your greatest asset as an actor because it allows you to access so many things. It allows you to be observant and to have an extreme empathy even for a character that you might not that might not be that likable, but yet you have to infuse them with human life. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that it's it's yeah, it's hard because it attracts I would say that your sensitivity is often your greatest asset because it allows you so much, so much room to feel. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you still have to take care of yourself. And yep. if you're, if you're allowing whatever's happening on stage or with that character to bleed into your own personal life or whatever, then that would be a point to take a step back and say like, okay, does this feel healthy? Does this feel not? Um, and I think that there's a lot of different ways to deal with that. Mine is, you know, Take a break. Make sure you make friends with people who are not in theater so you get a break from that as the thing you talk about all the time. Make sure you're interested in other forms of art and you're not just going to theater all the time. And go to therapy. You know, talk to people. Make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Yep. Yeah. So Tony actually does a self-care coaching specifically for actors that's very cool so you may want to consider him that's exactly <laughs> that what he does sounds like a very very necessary um thing to have for actors. yeah totally yeah. it's hard and it's hard to read bad reviews and it's hard to walk in a room and feel like you nailed it and get a no and it's all really hard but i would say that if you if you can find a way to deal with it it's one of the most rewarding 
careers. Yeah. And I, and I think that goes to anything that is creative, that when you're creating something from yourself and putting it out in the world, um, it's, it's very risky because if it doesn't work, it's really tough and it's really de- can be devastating. Mm-hmm. But if it does work and people receive it, yeah. you know, you guys, I'm sure both know this. If it's a, it, it's very exhilarating mm-hmm. and it, and it touches something that you can't really get, I think, in other jobs. Yeah. Well, the thing I always come back to too, and I, m- I imagine it's the same way for painters, but I always come back to the phrase of, I have to like it. I have to like my work. And if I don't like my work, then we have a problem. But if I can walk out of an audition and feel like I liked that, I thought that was good, I can hang my hat on that, and I don't get a call back, fine. But if I walk out thinking I could have put in another hour, I could have tried a little harder, I could have asked for help on this audition, then then we have a problem because I don't like my work. And if I can like my work and walk away, then everyone else's opinion, to some extent, doesn't really matter. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, yeah. Yeah, I can agree with that. I know I have um I have one particular painting that I did that I think a lot of people don't really like, but I love it. Like it's one of my favorite paintings I ever did and I don't really care that people don't really yeah. like it. It doesn't really bother me. Yeah, um, I have I have a few of those. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's really interesting. Yeah, I wonder what that is. Is that I don't what is the painting of that you're thinking of? Like what's it, what's the subject matter? Um it pro- it's probably it's a subject matter that means a lot to me. It's right. it's a That was uh, what I was going to guess. Yeah, it's yeah. an amusement park ride and it's of an amusement park ride and it's at night. Hmm. So it's basically just the lights. So it's really unique and I I feel like it's something that it was kind of, I felt it was daring for me to do. And also, um, I think it's just a unique painting, and I'm just really glad that I did it. And I don't know if nobody wants it or doesn't buy it. I don't know. I'm okay. I, I'm right. really glad that I did it. But I bet you, if enough people see it, because it meant that much to you and has your heart in it, I bet you it'll resonate with somebody. That would be my guess. Yeah, I just would... enough people see it. Okay, you're probably you're probably that's my I don't know yeah. So Hannah, do you have a couple tips, suggestions, ideas that you can provide people that are listening to help them move things forward creatively for themselves? I'd say take a class. Whatever you're interested in, what it doesn't matter. Go take a class because even if you take it and you don't like it, I bet you'll meet someone cool. Even if it's just one person, I bet you'll meet someone cool that has a similar interest. So. You know, I'm really scared of improv. I'm terrified. I don't get it. I, As an actor, it scares the crap out of me. So I'm taking an improv class at Second City. And I just feel like, you know, I live in Chicago. I have to take advantage yeah. of these things. You know, I'm people are going to see that on my resume. Yeah. So I'm doing what scares me. So I'm terrified and excited for that. Um, yeah, take a class. Okay, great. I think that is a, that's a fantastic suggestion. Thank you. Kevin, how about you? Uh, my suggestion would just be to do it. Like, I don't know if you want, you're interested in drawing, painting, acting, whatever, just do it. Cause like, and not also just do it, but don't be concerned about the results at first. Cause it's going to be bad. It might look really good at first, but you're going to look back and think it's bad, but yeah, just do it and see how it feels. Um, and you're going to get better. Like, uh, a lot of people, I can say a lot of people occasionally people are like oh you're so talented and it's like I appreciate that but it's like look at my early stuff it's bad like it takes work and anybody can do it you will get better and you will see results if you just do it yeah yeah I yeah and I can definitely agree with you as it relates to visual arts well really anything I mean it's like well first of all anything that you start is going to probably suck yeah to begin with <laughs> yep. no matter what and it's hard and eventually it will be okay. Mm -hmm. And if you keep doing it, it'll be good. Yeah. And I think that doesn't matter if you're learning French, if you're learning snowboarding, if you're painting, or probably even if you're acting. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with the acting part? Oh, yeah. I mean, the best part is that a lot of people who end up doing acting long term are just the people who stuck with it the most and said like, no, I still want to be good at this. Because at the beginning, you're just flailing around trying to put something together and it takes years it takes years to get to know technique and how to 
move your body and all those things. But the people who stick with it. I think that's, I think that is relevant though to anything. I mean, yeah, I think that a lot of people who are successful, they just stayed with it. Yeah. Right. And especially um, art, I think it's, yeah, it's that will that is almost, you know, there's not, I don't really necessarily think there's talent. I mean, sure, there's some natural talent and skill, but like it's a lot of it is learned and it's just the will to keep doing it, to keep making new stuff, to keep acting. Just, yeah. I always say it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. <laughs> yeah. and But I think uh, one of the challenges for people is that it's hard and it it doesn't feel good when you're doing something and you're not doing it well. Mm-hmm. And it, brings, and it brings up a lot of sometimes emotions and feelings Absolutely. about being inadequate. And that's uh, so it's not necessarily always a good experience, um, but you have to just plow through it and eventually. Well, the nice thing about drawing or painting, if it's bad, you can crumple it up and throw it away. <laughs> you can put it at the very bottom of your stack. Yeah, but not if it's on a canvas because then you have this big canvas. Well, you can always paint <laughs> I mean, over it. Yeah, and you could s- start small. That would be my suggestion. I mean, if it's bad, put it in the closet. No one's ever going to see it. That's good. I I've been I never posted my first painting on Instagram, and I've been kind of thinking about doing it. It's just kind of like to motivate other people to try and be like, you know, Whoever liked my most recent painting, look at this first one I did. It was bad. So uh, I think that sounds like a good idea. I think yeah, pe- I, think I might pe- do it. <laughs> I think people would appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so Hannah, where can people find more about what you are all about? <laughs> um, I finally sat myself down and made a website. Um, and unfortunately, it's the really long version because it's I made it through Wix, and so it's like hannahruey.com slash wick slash my site or something crazy like that so i don't actually know the address off the top of my head okay so why don't we why don't you give the spelling of your name okay. and then people can just google that sure sure my name is hannah Rui. it is spelled h-a-n-n-a-h Rui is spelled r-u-w-e okay cool and then kevin what about you where can people go to see all of your work and hopefully that first painting that you ever <laughs> did you will be posting soon Okay, I I feel like I'm pot committed now to do that. But, um, <laughs> so I am on Instagram. I don't have a personal website. Might be something I'll do in the near future. But my Instagram handle is Lilla Hummer. It's just like Lilla Hammer Norway, but with the U. So L I L L E H U M M E R. And then I also uh, my first show in a gallery, uh, Gallery Studio O in Ravenswood. The artwork is actually up now. It's a group showing. Uh, the opening artist reception is Friday, September 6, uh, 6 to 9 p.m. So, yeah. Well, cool. Well, thank you, guys. This yeah. was really, I thought this was really great. I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you. You're very welcome. Kevin's show will be at Gallery Studio O in Chicago until September 27th. My name is Ricky McGeckrin, and you have been listening to Eager to Know, the podcast. If you haven't already, please go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join me next week for another Eager to Know podcast. 